Hey there, everyone out there in BSV land. Hope uh, all of those who were lucky enough to go to CoinGeek in Toronto uh, had a good time and they're all recovering nicely now. I'm happy to say the next one coming up in October is a lot closer to where I live, so I hope to see you there. Uh, that's in Seoul, by the way. Check it out. So right now I've got for you an interview I did with Paul Chiari of WeatherSV.com just the other day. And I think his story is pretty interesting, as is his location and his use case for the BSV blockchain. That's been around since about uh, April this year, but Paul himself has been around much longer. All right, listen to his story, and uh, I'll see you back next time. Later. All right, today I'm talking to Paul Chiari, and he's got a service called Weather SV, which allows people to track weather in their location and hopefully a lot more. So, Paul, how are you doing? Yeah, great. Thanks, John. Yeah, thanks a lot for having us on and having a chat today. Great. Can, just before we get started, can you tell us a little bit about who you are and uh, what your background is and how you got into this? Um, well, I suppose, you know, um, an IT professional, I guess, for a better word, I've worked in the IT industry for well, getting on about 30 odd years now and uh, you know in previous background in sort of you know corporate type IT services mm. um, but yeah about 20 years ago or so I've uh, relocated to uh, what I find to be a nicer friendlier part of Australia a bit out of the city and up to the northern reaches of the country and uh, been sort of essentially doing my own consultancy and IT business up here, which has developed over time um, to, you know, a reasonable IT business in the region, supporting a lot of local business infrastructure and whatnot, you know, with staff mm -hmm. and all the normal things that go along with the daily running of a business, I guess. So, so you said you're in Atherton, which is in, in the tropical parts of far north Queensland near Cairns in Australia. Uh, so that's, right. that, that's not your typical, you know, IT professional hub. So how did you, what sort of work are you doing up there? Oh, look, I mean, it, you know, it varies. I mean, you know, in any regional area, you probably have to be a little bit more general. You can't mm. specialize as much as you may in other areas. But, um, you know, there, there's all the sort of normal types of professional business and so forth that you'll find uh in any any part of the world or Australia, I mean, and Cairns itself is quite a, a populous place. There's a reasonable amount yeah. of business and whatnot down there. So, uh, you know, we service clients quite around the region from Port Douglas, to Innisfail, Cairns, the Tablelands area. Mm -hmm. So that, that that's probably our primary focus has been over the years in terms of business IT infrastructure. Um, the area itself was you know, went through quite a boom, I guess, back in around 2012, 2013. A lot of mining and government money being invested up in the area for research and other stuff. So we were fortunate enough to um, be, you know, um, I, guess, I guess develop quite a share of that type of business that was around at the time. Those things have slowed down considerably um, with the mining boom coming to a bit of an end and whatnot over the last few years. But mm -hmm. we've sort of turned our minds to other things um one of the areas i guess which um helped to sort of lead us into weather sv and some of the stuff we're looking at there is you know around wi-fi wireless stuff we started off within i guess the tourism type part of the industry of hotspots and whatnot you know paid and free wi-fi access into caravan parks resorts um, right. backpack accommodation or motels hotels all that sort of thing um, and, and that's then also had led us into a bit more infrastructure type wireless um, developments and connections into the ag tech world, which, mm -hmm. which is where a, a lot of the ideas that we're developing around the blockchain uh, sort of stem from, I guess, some of the issues within agriculture, supply chain, inefficiencies in production and supply of the um, produce. That often, that often sounds very appealing to me, you know, like just stuck in the middle of the city here with all the noise and the activity. Like I'd love to be in a place like that, I think. Yeah, yeah, it's different. It's nice. Um, you know, sometimes you miss the bright lights and all the busyness of the city and yeah. so forth. But you know, for the most part, I, I, I like it. My wife and 
myself left Sydney about 20 odd years ago. We mm -hmm. spent about two years traveling around Australia, mm -hmm. not doing a hell of a lot of work at that time and uh, just seeing what the country was about and what was out there. And we sort of got around to here. We'd gone down from Sydney and around the West Coast and up and through the Territory, stopped up in the Territory for a while. And mm -hmm. probably as we were heading back down to Sydney and found this region and thought, oh, well, maybe we just stick it here for a while. And 20 years later, here we are, yeah. Very cool. Did, did you actually find out what the country's all about? I'm still trying to figure it out too. Oh, look, you never you never really figure it all out, but yeah. you know, you certainly see a lot of different sides to it, which mm -hmm. uh, give you a better idea of how it all fits together and, you know, the different opinions of different people from different places and different problems and issues that they have in their life and day-to-day -day reality that you just have no idea about, you know, live, growing up and living in Sydney. It's, True. you know, very, very different place to remote areas of the Kimberleys and, mm -hmm. you know, other parts of Australia that, you know, the remoteness and the distance is quite an amazing issue, I guess, you know. Yeah, it would present a whole lot of challenges. I mean, when you grow up in Australia, you always hear a lot about that, you know, the radio links and school of the air, yeah. flying doctor, that kind of thing. It's just that tyranny of distance, the expense of things, you know, the expense of doing things. Um, yeah. Big, big area, but, you know, for a while I worked up in Darwin for Territory Health Services and just seeing working in that environment and seeing how how you translate the services that you deliver in a city hospital or town environment to, you know, a remote indigenous community, you know, hundreds of kilometers from nowhere. So I guess it's um it's kind of curious that you got into blockchain and cryptocurrencies up there. Was that something that you've long been fascinated about or is it just something that you discovered more recently? Oh no, definitely, yeah, something had quite a um interest in over time i mean being in the tech world the it world you you know obviously come across these kind of things that i actually i think the you know because there were, there were a few you know as you probably know before bitcoin that sort of went along these kind of ideas of um, digital type currency payment systems and whatnot mm -hmm. i think the first one that i sort of really got any involvement with would have been e-gold and that was probably about really? 2001 2002 uh -huh. and what got you into uh, that into e-gold. Yeah. Yeah, just, well, just the promise, you know, that this was a new type of commerce, a new type of money that could be traded on the internet. You know, the the as the e-gold ecosystem was expanding back in those days, there were more and more merchants and stuff accepting e-gold as a payment method. Mm -hmm. I obviously like the sort of the concept of the soundness, that it was the value of your asset was related back to gold that was stored uh, to back that asset. and as the gold price increased, you know, the value of your asset increased. But, um, yeah, unfortunately, that all came to some sort of grinding halt when the US government shut it all down and uh, took control of all the accounts and all the holdings. Um, yeah, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on who you listen to. Yeah, yeah, true. Um, but, you know, the, the fortunate side effect of all that was that they actually closed it down right at the time when gold prices peaked at about 1800 US dollars. Right. So the process then was over, it did take a while, like a, a year or two uh, from that point to be able to prove identity and go through all the measures that they, requirements that they had to be able to get your funds back. Uh, but then eventually when the funds got paid out, um, they were paid out at the, the, the yeah, basically the, or oh, I think it was pretty much an all time high gold price. So, you know, mm -hmm. good, great. And, and, uh, you know, it was, I guess, through that time there when Bitcoin started to come around and I was sort of looking at that and I was interested in the technology and stuff. But I, I just didn't quite, in the early stages, see the difference between something like e-gold and other systems and Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess I sort of held myself back a bit thinking, oh, you know, it'll only, probably only get closed down by the government or what have you. Yeah. Um, but then as I further looked into Bitcoin and how it worked and, and you started to see that, well, you know, it's, it is different in the sort of the distributed nature of the system so that it would be a lot harder for, you know, that sort of thing to happen, you know, for a government agency just to come out, come come in and seize all the assets, so to speak. And mm -hmm. yeah, so once I sort of got my head around that, I, I, I then sort of started to take a little bit more interest in the technology and using it. You know, I was getting a few Bitcoin. Unfortunately, I wasn't smart enough to think about 
the the value that these things may a, obtain over time. I mean, I was just looking at ways to use it, ways to spend it, and that mm. sort of thing. Playing around with that, that was pretty good and interesting. And uh, then it was really probably maybe around two fifteen or something when there was a lot of talk about smart contracts running on Bitcoin. There was a a video and a bit of information I'd watched regarding the color coins and. Mm-hmm. That sort of concept, and that's where I started to really think about the technology and the business aspects, the ability to store and and retrieve data on the blockchain, smart contracts, and you know these associated things that you could start to then lay on top of the networks. That that yeah, really got me interested. But um, unfortunately, you know the time frame. I mean, I was sort of expecting the way things were headed at the time that by 2016, 2017 that realities of doing a lot of that stuff on the bitcoin network would have sorted themselves out and scaling would have occurred and all these kind of things that needed to happen being able to look back we we realized that it just didn't quite go the way we'd all probably hoped at the time you know Mm -hmm. or maybe it did (laughs) which would bring me to the next question (laughs) you're asking people how they got into bitcoin and then asking people how they got into bitcoin sv are sort of related but separate questions so is it was it the scaling issue that got you into that in the first place? Uh, yeah, it was definitely. I mean, you know, you just sort of started to wonder really what was going on with the whole thing. Like I, you know, I expected there, there there were plenty of people at the time that seemed to be on the right track. That yeah, we knew that it had to scale. We had to yeah. keep on top of the demand. So you sort of thought the common sense would prevail and these opinions would come to the fore. But mm-hmm. I don't know really how it all happened. But they just got shoved aside. This other narrative came about that sort of controlled the uh development and Mm -hmm. yeah then as soon as i guess things like you know bitcoin cash and that's that split started to happen and we looked at you know people were saying the things you know that need to be said i mean craig wright had come out and told the miners about getting their you know twenty thousand dollar machine to support the network and all the rest of it and you you know you, you realize that okay i'm not the only one out there, there are other people who, who, who think that this is the future for Bitcoin and it has to scale, it has to be cheap, it has to be fast. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, so so just as that's developed, I've just followed along with that line of thought and gone with the flow. And, uh, you know, obviously the whole Bitcoin cash thing was then a bit unfortunate again, but mm-hmm. I think now, you know, we can finally see some, you know, blue skies ahead, light yeah. at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. It all seems to be coming into clarity now. I certainly hope so. Yeah, it's uh, mm. e- even if some people are probably going to take a lot longer to come around to the idea. I think once they do, they're going to find out that this is this is exactly what they started off with. Like nothing really changed. Mm. Maybe a few no, other right. personalities changed, but mm. no, that's always yeah, been happening anyway. Just sort of fulfilling the original promise, really, of Bitcoin. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I just find it hard to believe how these. Other people can come out now and say that Bitcoin's not meant to be fast or Bitcoin's not meant to be cheap or any of this sort of business. Yeah. I mean, you know, where did that where did that narrative come from? I, I don't get it. Where did it come from indeed? Yeah, to me that, yeah. that represents the, the radical departure from the original vision. Like not, mm, not so definitely. when you when the project you believe in has forked away from the main chain, like there's a tendency to see yourself as the fringe group. But uh it's it's really not that way at all. Like it's the the big group broke away and then is slowly trickling back. I think. Hmm. That's right. Yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah. To, to explain, but I'm I'm sure there's plenty of us out there that think exactly the same. You know, we know what we want. We know what it should be about, and you know, we sort of have some understandings of the economics about the utility of this thing moving forward, and mm-hmm. you know, as the rewards disappear we need to be building filling that up that void up with transactions to keep the miners on board to keep them profitable to continue securing the network and all the rest of it it's just you know i don't know just to me it makes sense but yeah clearly clearly there's other ideas about it all yeah we sure do and and it's i guess it's people like you who are building out the ecosystem with like interesting things for people to check out you know proofs of concept that kind of thing just just to show people what it can do because otherwise they they might look at it and they're saying, well, what can I actually do with this? You know, they might understand mm. a little bit about what it is, but they don't really know what it can do. I think most people outside of the IT world have a bit of trouble grasping that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, that, that really gets back to our original idea, 
sort of prior to actual weather SV as such, but when we just started broadcasting weather data from the local area. Right. And, um, you know, just like it is now, when you actually go into one of those weather channels, you know, you can track each of your transactions, you know, like mm-hmm. so it'll show you the latest update and then you've got your transaction ID. You can move along the points of the previous updates and see the transactions related to that data. And yeah, that, that, that was very much what we wanted to be able to demonstrate, you know, not to the world at that point, just to people locally that we're doing business with, that we're talking about solutions for agriculture and other sort of data collection and dissemination ideas. And and it, it was just a simple, simple tool that we could sit down with somebody and guide them through and demonstrate how that relates back to the blockchain. Okay, and, sure. Uh, well, I guess it sort of would... came, you know, with the idea of weather data being our yeah. proof of concept from the range of types of data that we were looking at at the time. Yeah, for sure. Okay, this, I guess this is the best time. Uh, the best time to introduce weather SV. Now, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw a screenshot up on the screen now, which is just the splash page to the website. I know it goes deeper than that. So, can you just tell us a little bit about what it is and uh, how it works and how it uses SV? Yeah, look, it, it's it's very basic. I mean, essentially, really, all we're doing is, I suppose, building a Bitcoin at autonomous weather machine you know it, it takes data from you know, public available feed, feeds um, provided somebody funds the channel and we have uh, funding in the channel address to maintain the transactions we're just taking the data from the feeds off the internet uh, repackaging them I suppose into our transaction system that we've built here our engine mm-hmm. and broadcasting them onto the network uh, and uh, each each time, you know, yeah, basically you're looking at um, hourly updates from each of those stations. So we've got 24 updates a day uh, of data just coming in. And as long as the funds are there to transact it, then we just transact that straight through onto the BSB blockchain. And then obviously through the page, you can go in then and... Uh, from, of, well, of, in the back end, I mean, there's quite a few little bits and pieces involved in that. And then you've got your things like your bit index on the other end, indexing the transactions and so forth. And then our side will report on those results and, you know, create the basic weather, weather chart, weather display that we have available on the site and, or through our widget, which is now available. So that's completely stored on chain and we've got data um, like a, chain-based API access to the data. Very straightforward. I mean, you know, when we we're, were originally starting to think about the proof of concept, I was sort of, you know, obviously along the lines of having to think about um, hooking up different devices and whatnot to our platform and, and taking that data in and transacting it and so forth. But when you sort of break down the concept of a proof of concept or the idea of a proof of concept, you, you really don't need to be doing everything that you plan to do down the track. Um, and and weather data for us was a very simple starting point because it wasn't particularly uh, confidential. It's not hard to get a hold of. It's any of that sort of stuff. And uh, an internet feed is as good as a live station, really, at this point in our trajectory. We just figured, okay, right. as long as we can get data, really what we had to spend time developing and understanding and building was our, our you know, chain, chain transaction system, our BSV transaction system, mm-hmm. which, you know, um, once again, just all sort of fell into place thanks to some of the incredible stuff that Unrider started to release earlier in the year with DataPay and BitDB and so forth. And that, that really just made our job relatively easy. You know, we didn't have to do a lot of the heavy lifting, so to speak. We just had to, you know, build our components on top of those products and those services. And, and uh, you, you know, I think in the initial release that we did with just the Cairns Weather data really sort of took us two or three days to put that together and and start broadcasting obviously there's been a lot more go on over time the platform scaled and we're doing a lot more transactions different issues have come up and we've had to change the way we do a few things and scale Mm -hmm. the concept of our platform but but that's been great you know i mean it's a fantastic learning experience for us it's enabled us to build an engine that we now know can handle significant daily transactions and Mm. So yeah, been, been when did you actually experience. when did you actually launch it, and how long did it take you to build it all? I think it was third of April. Mm-hmm. We launched sort of the public um, accessible part of WeatherSV. So 
we'd probably got the cans with the broadcasting back sometime in late January, early February, I think. Um, and then we, you know, we hadn't really done too much other than what we were doing. And it, it, was, it was a bit of interest on Twitter. Uh, people like um, Brendan Lee at Coin Storage Guru down in Brisbane and there's Wildcard in Melbourne. Mm -hmm. And they, they were like, I oh, sort of expressing some interest about running their own local weather stations and so forth. And I'd, I'd actually gone down to Brisbane and, and talked with Brendan and met with him. And yeah, he was quite keen on the idea and what we were doing and all that. So, yeah. so you know, we, we were just sort of really just sitting around thinking, oh, you know, maybe we could uh, open it up. Be, you know, we've got access to all these stations through this data mm -hmm. channel. You know, we could build the site and people could come in and activate their channel and, uh, you know, put some money into the transaction fund and we'll see where we go. You know, if we thought, oh, we could get maybe 50, 50 uh, channels activated or something like that, that'd give us a nice data set that we can work with and expand on over time and test different technologies and so forth as they become available. Um, so, yeah, there was it, it didn't really take us, you know, I'd say probably two to three weeks of reasonable effort um, to sort of, then start to build that site in t to such a way that we could yeah, enable the integration of um, the channels the way we have and so forth, yeah. Very cool. And it does actually cost money for your service to open the channel, and that, that's what people are paying for when they pay their, you said, five Australian dollars to open a channel? I think it is. Yeah, so at the moment, so it, when they, with the five Australian dollars, we basically, uh, $2 is going into, you know, our development fund and all the rest of it and we, we obviously the pay for some back-end expenses our cloud hosting and so forth mm -hmm. um type things and you know developing the product hopefully moving forward and then three dollars goes straight into the transaction fund so that then creates a future pool of transactions based on the exchange rate at the time Are you which is running hit uh in the last you know yeah. it's great that the price of bsv is up but then um the amount of transaction you can lock in for your dollar obviously declines so yeah just just roughly there i think in the last couple of weeks we've gone from about getting 330 locked in transactions for the three australian bucks down to just over 80 or 80 something now with the mm -hmm. latest price increase i'm just taking a look at the map again now and You've got channels all over the world, except maybe for the very, uh, very icy parts and the very deserty parts. So yeah, that, yeah, it's absolutely every one, of, I mean, every one of those yeah, little we, points on the map is a is an SV user who's opened a channel. Is that right? Yeah, that's an active channel. That's right. Uh -huh. I mean, it's not necessary. You know, there, there clearly some people have gone in and activated multiple channels. Um, yeah, I think they like the idea that the 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 pool of transactions that we're building up and helping to test the services and the network and all the related ideas around data storage and pricing and all the rest of it. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's just amazing. We, we just cannot believe that that many people have actually um, contributed to the, to the project and yeah, helped us to achieve the, the current transaction list. Cause I think, I think at the moment we're sort of up over 27 on our way to 28,000 transactions a day. We've got, yeah. Six point eight million or so transactions locked in. Um, so, so basically, you know, if we if everybody just stopped feeding this machine today, and no more money went into it, we'd still broadcast six point eight million transactions before it dies. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's just just amazing, really. Uh, the the page I'm looking at maybe. now says it's got one thousand one hundred and fifty five active channels, but there's obviously a lot more transactions that go into that, right? Yeah, well, each of those is uh, twenty four a day. So yeah. you got your hourly updates on eleven hundred and fifty five channels. Yeah, is it when someone pays the five dollars to open a channel, what, what do they actually get? Like, is it is it suitable for uh, just a general consumer, or would it be more appropriate for someone who's developing an app of their own and want to use the API? Oh, I. I guess, you know, that's up to the individual cause. I, I, we certainly have a lot of people, I mean, from some of the feedback we're getting, just just general people, they, they, and they even could be into something like sailing or flying or this or that, that mm -hmm. like to keep uh, track of the weather um, for their own personal reasons in the area over 
certain area. Um, there, I, I think there's a few people that are looking at their own apps where you'll see, you, you'll see sometimes as you break down to certain areas where some areas are very concentrated. There's been a lot of uh, channel activation within a small area. And I, I think that some, some people there are certainly looking at um, integrating that into their own apps, you know, for whatever else they're looking at and doing and so forth. Um, and what kind of data are they yeah. getting? It's, it's more than just your daily forecast, isn't it? Um, no, at the moment, I mean, you, you'll see if you just click into one of those channels. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we're keeping it fairly limited at the moment just, just to see how it goes with the expense and the transactions and the rising costs and all the rest of it. I, over time, I mean, my understanding is, you know, as, as we, the BSV chain scales, once we reach uh, your 512 or your gigabyte blocks, you know, in the not too distant future, uh, that the actual rates, you know, per satoshis per byte type scenario of your fees could decrease and i think over time they become a lot more economically viable to store uh more data but typically at the moment we're just doing you know your temperature humidity pressure uh your cloud cover and uh your wind speed and direction but you know forecast uh, these are definitely things we're thinking of. But I mean, even at the moment, you could sort of do it on a basis where you, you could probably enable it as a separate um, transaction within a channel. So if somebody mm. wants to enable the forecast for Sydney, Australia, then they could just fund that part and then you get through forecasts and other potential data that we could start bringing through into each channel. Yeah, even I'm thinking of using it as my daily weather channel here. I'm not an app developer yeah. or anything, but it looks it looks quite good, and the the design's pretty good as well. Yeah, and and the the little widget, if you can find that, I mean that's available through you know a Bico Media link or mm -hmm. your Bit links um, straight on chain, and you can uh, just put in your channel address, which you sort of get from once you activate a channel and you go into that channel, you'll see in the web link. Uh, the last part of the web link is actually a channel, the Bitcoin address type thing or Bitcoin is, SV yes. address yeah, just that funds that the now. channel. Now you just copy that, you can paste that into the widget and that'll uh, gives it a nice little tidy little weather display uh, oh, updating cool. daily. And uh, there's a say, bit of, there's the a working version, we... I think, too, within the Agora now, mm -hmm. the Agora guys. Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of uh, Agora, as you can probably see. Yeah, yeah, I like the t-shirt. Yeah, Thank it's you. great, isn't it? I, I love Agora, yeah. From what I've seen of it so far, I think it's got huge potential that moving forward. Yeah, I think both them and what you're doing is just uh, it's just very indicative of the kind of activity that's happening on Bitcoin SV. Like, people are just being a lot more creative. They can do a lot more with the data. Uh, they have a lot more space to play around. Whereas that, that's other blockchains are kind of limited in that respect, especially Bitcoin. Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, yeah, we just did up a few stats there the other day and, you know, things would have changed a little bit, obviously, in the last day with a, another price hike. But um, yeah. I think we were looking there, it might have been Tuesday when I sort of did a bit of a snap snapshot of the stats and, you know, it's basically for those 1,155 channels, broadcasting per day was working at about 22 Australian dollars uh per day but you do the sums on what that would cost to run on bitcoin and it, it's over a hundred thousand dollars a day Oof. and i mean and, and, and that, that's just based on the you know the basic times multiplier of the expense of the transactions mm -hmm. but i think i think the reality is that it'd actually be a lot more expensive because um i may be incorrect about this but i think it, i think this is right that the the op return field in in a BTC Bitcoin transaction is still only 40 bytes. So um, our typical broadcast is about 160 byte on mm. bytes on top of the actual transaction payload. So so I think realistically, if you were doing this sort of a thing on to Bitcoin, uh, BTC Bitcoin, you would have to split it into four transactions. So you'd have the overhead of each of those transactions on top of your data. So, so you know, I don't know, it might be more like 150,000 or more just to, do something as simple as what we're doing you know it's crazy mm -hmm. now i guess one thing i've been asking people for a long time is that 
do you is it absolutely necessary to build this kind of system on a blockchain platform like could could you just do this through a regular regular interface and api uh, just have a database server running at your end that people can access or does does having it on the blockchain having it on bitcoin sv actually make things more automated and easier um, look, I think there's definite benefits there in terms of uh, being on the blockchain and Bitcoin. And we, we, we're we only just starting to develop our side of all this at the moment. But I think moving forward, it's going to be a lot easier to integrate more devices or just say like you had your own weather station or so forth. Mm-hmm. You know, really then all you've got to do is put in a bit of an intermediary device to take that data, package it up and transmit it onto chain. And then, you know, you can plug that into our platform. We can recognize the transaction included in and away we go. So I, I think certainly in, in bringing devices and machines on board over time, I think the, the Bitcoin platform uh, makes that a lot easier than that interfacing into web systems and web servers and all that side of thing. Um, but, but really the thing for us, um, the, where we see the blockchain as being the big advantage is on the bigger picture side. As, as I sort of say, weather data for us was just like, okay, we're looking at all these data types. Well, you know, I guess uh, my interest is is in um, working out some solutions around the problems of agriculture, the inefficiency in production, the inefficiency in the supply chain and all these other things. And that, that, that to me is, I, I think once you start bringing more of this sort of data on chain and using it within the supply chain and making it available to all the stakeholders to get the latest data, add, contribute to the data and so forth, that's when I think the blockchain really comes into its own. There's no doubt in terms of just recording weather data as it is today, yeah. you can go to the site that we basically feed the data from and, and, and use that on a standard sort of web platform or database server. But um you know the I, th- I think the blockchain yeah we, when you're looking at the bigger picture problems and stuff and and especially around the supply chain i think it has a huge potential moving forward and, and really we're just starting now to experiment with taking data and getting it into that you know onto the blockchain is really just mm-hmm. a first step for us in that regard is it just you working on this or do you have a team Oh, no, we got a team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't really do. I mean, I, I don't mind sort of a bit of a high level development kind of thing. Look at the options available. Look at what Unride is doing, looking how this is going to fit in and make a bit of a plan based on that. But yeah, I've got uh, guys that work for me that do most of the development side of thing, the design stuff and all that. And, you know, they're, they're just great, you know, and really proud of what they've done and what they've been able to achieve. I mean, I. I would say, okay, well, let's do this, let's do that. But, you know, really they're the guys that are making it happen, you know. Are they all in your local area or do you all work in different locations? Oh, no, no, we, we're here. Like, we're, we're a normal business, you know, right. like an IT business doing okay. everyday work, you know, paying for our bills. This is really just a bit of a side project for us uh-huh. that we started working on and thought, you know, okay, as I was sort of saying before, once, once I sort of saw those things become available, once the BSV roadmap was sort of laid down and you had Unrider coming out with different products, you know, and these ideas have been fermenting for years and it was just like, look, I, you know, I said to the guys, we put together a bit of an overview and said, look, I think it's time for us to start making making inroads into this technology because all the pieces of the puzzle are coming together for us, you know. Excellent. Yeah, and it's uh, people, like I said before, it's people doing that that are going to make Bitcoin SV a lot more compelling. So it's become one of those projects that we're sort of quite happy to spend time on, you know, outside of work and, you know, you know, to just to, to try and make it happen because you've only got so many hours in the day and yeah. we've got to keep the lights on and pay wages and all that sort of stuff. So Yeah, yeah I think a, a lot of people in SV are kind of doing it in their spare time at the moment, but uh, who knows, that could change as early as next week. Yeah, well, that'd be great. I mean, we'd really love to uh, start dedicating more of our week to week. Uh, uh, you know, I suppose the time that we allocate to work within a week, um, that we can allocate more of that to projects within the blockchain space and on BSV and expanding the capabilities of Weather SV and other ideas that we have. Then, yeah, I'd, I'd love to love to move more into that on a day to day basis. But 
yeah, economic realities as they are. We just have to <laughs> work our way towards it. Well, I remember the there, were, there were a lot of people around the end of uh, 2013, I think it was, who were doing Bitcoin as a hobby. And then by January 2014, they were all doing it as a full-time paid job. So, yeah, things can, things can move pretty fast. I mean, we just see what's happened in these last six months. I mean, it's amazing, you know. Yeah. They seem to take a long time to arrive at this point. But now that you've got uh, this momentum behind, I guess, really Bitcoin and what Bitcoin should be, mm -hmm. it's just great to see how quickly things are happening, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, that's uh, that's probably a good point to wrap things up. But can you just tell everyone where where they can find more out about uh, Bitcoin SV? Uh, sorry, not Bitcoin SV. Where they can find out more about uh, Weather SV and where they can find you on social media, etc. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I suppose most most of the social media uh, engagement we're doing through Twitter, mm -hmm. um, and that's sv underscore weather okay the twitter hand sv um, underscore weather yes yeah uh yeah. so we, we we try to you know keep that fairly up to date with any updates that we're doing any things that are going on any new improvements to the site and so forth we'll broadcast out there and really there's a site itself you know it, it's once you get on there um start clicking around have a look into what you can do and all the rest it's fairly self-explanatory and terms of how to uh, go through, find a channel in your region, um, activate it. The only thing being there at the moment, it's all through money button. So mm -hmm. you've just got to have the account set up with money button and the wallet set up and yeah, away you go. It's yeah. pretty straightforward. So the website itself is just, it's the HTTPS site and weathersv.app. Yeah, dot app dot app, right? Weathersv dot app. Yeah, you can get. I think if you just type weathersv dot com as well, it should should. Um, oh really? Take okay. You to this location. I'll, I'll yeah. check that out. All right, Paul. Well, thanks a lot for talking to us today. Much appreciated. Yeah, no, no worries at all, John. Yeah, thanks a lot for having a chat and showing some interest in our project. And that's great. Thank you. Great. Have a good day.